welcome everybody to this pre-session on the sales tax on groceries. Um, there will be no public invited behavior tonight. This is information only. Um, and we let's do a roll call for uh, council members. Um, Sean McCoy, uh, City Council. Um, Mayor Pro Tem, Susie Lowe Perry. Councilwoman Diane Christ. Mayor Joan Heck, Chiquita Yarbo City Council. Marcia Martin, City Council. Aaron Rodriguez, City Council. So we have staff here as well, so I'm going to just pass it over to our city manager. Yeah, Mayor and Council, um, as you all have asked some questions regarding the sales tax on groceries, um, what that looks like, impact, uh, we wanted to have a pre session today because there are a lot of different moving pieces in this, and what you will see from Jim is there's legal issues involved in it as well, or issues related to our bonds. Um, so this is a pre-session. We wanted to give this to you, have a chance for a conversation. Our plan is to then bring this back again for a public conversation um, in a study session environment down the road to give you a chance to digest and then provide us some questions and then we'll bring it back in in a study session. Great. Jim? Good evening, uh, Mayor, members of Council. So uh, I'm Jim Golden, Chief Financial Officer. Don Town is also going to be making part of this presentation with me. We have a couple of uh, members from our bond council here tonight on teams, uh, Maria Harwood and Dalton Kelly. And then also uh, Richard Eastis, the sales tax administrator, is here to maybe potentially help answer some questions that comes up. Uh, it's kind of a detailed issue, so I've got a bit of a presentation to go through, but Feel free to stop me and ask questions along the way uh, as needed. So we'll go ahead and get started. Um, so, you know, the, the first slide did say sales tax on groceries, kind of changing the, the conversation to sales tax on food for home consumption because that is uh, the exemption that the state has is, is food for home consumption, and that's you know, defined by the state, and I'll get into a little bit of that in a, in a minute or two, but um, what other cities that do, do uh, tax food for home consumption do is that they follow the state's view on that. Um, so front range, uh, uh, front range counties also uh, exempt food for home consumption. The state collects their tax. Most front range northern Colorado cities do tax food for home consumption. The exceptions are Firestone, Frederick, Mead, and Loveland. Um, Fort Collins and Greeley have different tax rates, and I think what that means is, I think what happened is they started out by taxing food for home consumption, and they've had tax increases where they didn't apply the tax increase to, to food for home consumption, so they have two different rates. Um, go ahead and change that. That, that was just for Front Range, Northern Colorado. So for the metro area, it's pretty split up. Um, the cities that exempted in the metro area are Denver, Aurora, Lakewood, Commerce City, Greenwood Village, Englewood, Glendale, and Sheridan. And those that tax uh, include Arvada, Westminster, Thornton, Broomfield, Littleton, Wheat Ridge, Parker, Golden, Edgewater, Federal Heights, and Castle Rock. If I left anybody out, I just, Missed them, but uh, didn't do it on purpose. Otherwise, and North Glen again is another city that has two different rates. So this is um, the allocation of our sales and use tax, and I'm pointing this out to you all. Uh, I think it's important to look at the allocation. I'll be coming back to talking about the allocation to the funds of our sales tax. Our total sales tax is 3.53% and uh, it goes to five different funds. The general fund and the public improvement fund get the, the initial base 2% that uh, is the first historical amount of the rate, sales tax rate. And then the next three are portions that are, are earmarked by voter designation for the street fund, the open space fund, and the public safety fund. So they all have, get revenue that has to go specifically for those purposes the total is 3.53%, and in 24, it's 104 million, almost $105 million of projected tax revenue in the budget. 
So um, the general fund has total ongoing revenue of almost 113 million in 24's budget. 50.38 million of that is from sales and use tax. 27.17 million is from property tax. So n neither of those taxes in the general fund are earmarked for specific use. But other revenue, <coughs> others, there are services in the general fund that have some offsetting revenues, things like recreation, development services, and things like that. And then we have other services in the general fund that, that hard, have hardly any offsetting revenues. And so, you know, by nature, that would mean that that most of the taxes that we're receiving in the general fund are going to offset those services. 73% uh, of our ongoing expenses in the general fund are employee related this year. Okay. So this is just taking a look at some of the net uh, costs uh, for some general fund services that do not have any or after their offsetting revenues. So in other words, these are being these amounts are being coming from sales and use tax or property tax. Public safety is 45.7 million. Parks and natural resources is six and three quarters million. 4.7 million for the library. 2.75 for human service agencies, and then senior services of 1.43 million. And now we have some more services at lower amounts here, but another five or six different services that we've identified. And there may be some smaller ones as well, but these are the ones that I pulled out that uh, would uh, um, have amounts over 100,000, let's say. So Jim, real quick, on the offsetting revenues and contacts for council, so... I should, yeah, you want to, ATF, yeah, so I was, yeah. was going to say, so for example, let's just take Jim and myself. There is a significant portion of our salary that while we're in the general fund, the other enterprise funds pay for connected to what we do. So we allocate, I allocate my time across water, wastewater, electric, um, broadband, and that comes in through the ATF, which is then offsetting that cost. And what we talk about in, in a lot of positions have that within the general fund. So that's a piece that I wanted to clarify and give you a practical example from Jim. So yeah, it's like city manager, city attorney, uh, shared service type divisions. They all have some sort of an offset of, of administrative transfer fee. So about half, in general, about half of those dollars are coming from taxes and the other half are coming from other funds within the city. So when you, that's, so the point is if you, when you reduce uh, the cost that you put in towards our position is you only save 50 cents on the dollar. Um, all right, so this is um, the projections that we have. I've got 2025 up here because 2024 is already on the way. If this were to take place in 25, we're projecting it's a $14 million total impact uh, of how much revenue we would receive in 25 from food for home consumption. This is a, as it breaks down across those five funds. Um, we are, did it mostly based on information from um, our major uh, tax collectors that, that sell food, including our groceries and discount stores. Uh, smaller um, entities, we, we didn't try to get because we had to work with the state to get some of this information because we do not have this type of information in our records because we don't exempt it. So we don't ask our our vendors to give us that information. They just tell us their total sales. But at the state level, they tell them what their total sales are, and then they say, here's how much our, our exemptions are for food for home consumption. So that's how we we're able to uh, get the data to identify the potential impact. But we only work with um, the larger ones, so that we, we didn't want to but the state for every account we could think of. And so uh, this is, I think, a reasonable projection. It could be higher. And again, this is for 2025. I'm next. You're next. Go for it. Right in the middle. All right, so uh, some residents, there are more chairs here. We have a few more chairs. Maybe there's a couple of ones. Say that. Um, there were questions from residents about um, initiating a, a petition to change this uh, in our ordinances. So this, um, 
the requirement for what those signatures are comes from the city's charter, section 5.2, um, and says that not less than 10% of the number of persons who are registered electors of the city as of the date of the last regular city election would be the number of signatures required. So what is that number? Uh, I checked with the county clerk um, who keeps the voter records. We don't keep those, of course. Um, and the county clerk provided me the number of 72,788 registered electors in Longmont. Longmont has grown uh, as of 11, November 7, 2023. So that is the date of our last regular election. So for a citizen initiative petition, uh, 7,278 signatures would need to be collected and more, right? Because typically you over collect because so many of them are, are not valid for what, many reasons. Um, state statute requires 5%. That was one of the questions. What is that? You know, how do we compare to the statute? Our charter says 10%. Uh, so we would go with what our charter says because we are home rule. Uh, and then one of the other questions was, I'm hitting the wrong button. What do other cities do? It is all over the board. Um, I just picked a few uh, that are within our size range along the front range. Castle Rock requires 10% of the total number of electors uh, on the date the form of the petition is approved. Loveland, 5% of the registered electors registered on the date of the filing of the statement of intent. So different time markers and different percentages. Boulder requires 10% of the average number of registered electors who voted in the two previous muni municipal candidate elections. Again, different. Pueblo, 5% of the total vote cast in the last general city election. Fort Collins, 10 or 15% of total ballots cast in the last regular city election. Depends if you're going for a regular or a special election with that ballot question. And Greeley, 10% of total vote cast in the last election, sort of like us. So kind of the gamut. Yeah. I have a question in regards to, um, and maybe this has no bearing on it at all, I'm just uh, curious. Uh, we've heard that sometimes people will pay to have somebody uh, uh, collect signatures. Is there any caveat in there uh, that uh, directs, you know, how that can be done? Those are those rules are provided by the state, and, and of course, petition gatherers would need to abide by those. Rules. And so they they can pay for. The yeah. They don't have to be residents of Longmont, for example, to collect signatures. Mm -hmm. right. um, so the process is can be lengthy. Uh, I laid out here what would be, I've called a vanilla uh, petition timeline. Uh, so uh, somebody would submit an intent to circulate a petition to the clerk. Uh, within five days, we would respond with an approval or a denial of that uh, petition form. That can be iterative until approval is achieved. So depending, I'm saying, great, great form submitted. Five days later, you would have approval. Um, and then once, signatures are uh, started, once you start collecting signatures, uh, you have 21 days uh, to get that petition filed with the city clerk's office. So only a 21 day time period uh, for signature collection. Uh, once submitted, we have 15 days to verify those 7,300 signatures. Come on down, we'll take volunteers. No. Um, <laughs> and that can also, you know, if insufficient, there's a cure period of an additional 15 days that would extend this time frame longer. Um, if we found the petition to be sufficient, then we're obligated to submit that to the council at the next regular session. And then the council would then, within 30 days, uh, adopt or repeal, you know, just take action, or um, set that for the next election, set that ballot question for the next election. Also noted, um, from the date of the petition filing, uh, there's a 40-day time clock that starts for uh, protest of that petition. So it's a very long and complicated time clock, that's my point. Um, and the notes that I have collected from previous clerks for the city of Longmont is, you better start way before June, get going, if you're hitting a November ballot. Because that time clock is, can be so large and, large, long and complex. Because um, the drop dead date for putting something on the ballot is August. August. Right, because we certify the ballot in September yeah. first first week ish. Yeah, that date moves, but you know, it took the election date. But right, it, it moves quickly once you start adding 40 days here and 15 days there. That all adds up. Mm -hmm. 
So the question also was posed, what was the last successful citizen initiative in Longmont? And it was the quote unquote fracking ban in 2012. They had to obtain 10% of the registered electors. At that time, it was 6,609 signatures and they met that bar. We've had two other um, completed, I will say approved petitions submitted, but not, uh, they didn't take the process to fruition since then. One was in 2018. Uh, to repeal sales tax on food in 2020 uh, regarding airport funding. Neither submitted petitions, those just didn't make it all the way through. Um, and then most uh, of interest perhaps for this conversation is Loveland's recent ballot measure 300. I reached out to their clerk. Um, again, they had to re collect 5% of registered electors signatures as of the date of filing the statement of intent. So that was 3,126 signatures. They had a 90-day window to collect those. Um, they did collect those, they were successful. That ballot uh, measure was number 300 on the November ballot and passed by a very large margin, 18,729 for and 9,650 against. Don't go through. So coming back to me, and uh, I thought I had a slide about defining food for home consumption, but I did not, so I want to just go back to that real quickly, although I will say that since we don't exempt food for home consumption, we're not experts on this. So all we have is the state's information, and it is, it's a, you know, an interesting definition, hard to follow, so I, I think what I'm going to read you here is what we have from it. Food for home consumption is generally defined as groceries and other foods that are not prepared, prepared prior to purchase and foods that are not consumed on premises. So if a food purchase can be consumed right after the purchase, it's not food for home consumption. Um, so um, there's a, you know, I was talking to Times Call reporter about this a little earlier and he threw a lot of different, what about this, what about that? I can't answer the what about this question here. Every time one comes up, I'm like, I don't know, I can go check that one. So, but in general, it's if it's good for, for a meal that you're going to prepare at home, it's generally exempt. But if they're preparing that meal for you, it, it is taxable still. So, um, we can move now into the. Um, so, we've got, we're going to talk about some uh, of the municipal bond issues related to this. So, um, so we have two bond issues that are backed with sales and use tax as a credit on those bonds. One is the open space bond issues. We should have had more than two. We have two types of bond issues, I should say. We have two open space bond issues backed by the 0 .20 open space sales tax. And then we have the 2019 sales and use tax bonds that were issued for the facility rehabilitation and replacement. They're, bar they're backed by the 2% uh, non-EMRC sales and use tax from the general fund and the public improvement fund. And by the way, if I say something that uh, I'm wrong on here, uh, Dalton or Maria, just jump right in if I've, I've misstated things. Just okay. uh, ask a real fast question. You bet. So the general fund um, has food tax dollars in it. Yes, Okay. right. So we so have we all, all five funds that receive sales tax receive this because what we, we do is every sales tax dollar is splitting up in these percentage okay. directions. Mm -hmm. So when I say that there are, that these bonds are backed by the tax, um, we, we do use the tax to make the debt payments, but we pledge uh, the full amount of the tax that is generated by the 0.20 of open space and the 2.0 of uh, the general fund and public improvement fund we, we, bet, we use them as a backing for the bonds. So it's for the, the purchase of the bonds, we're looking towards them. If for some reason our revenue were to, to go in the negative direction, they're looking at these revenue sources as we pledge, we would use those towards repaying these bonds. So we can go to the next page. Um, so within the city ordinances that we adopted uh, to sell the bonds, we have bond covenants, and in those we have um, it, we've covenanted that that we would not amend our sales and use tax ordinances in any way that would adversely affect the amount of pledged sales and use taxes 
which would otherwise be collected. Go one more. Um, so if we were to amend the sales and use tax ordinance to exempt the food for home consumption from the 2.2% tax pledged for general fund, public improvement fund, and open space fund to, to back these bonds, that would be prohibited as it reduced the amount of available pledged revenue. Uh, only way we could do that is if we were to receive consent from the majority of the bondholders who have purchased these bonds or hold these bonds uh, so that we need their majority of their permission to amend the bond ordinance. Um, any questions on that? Go ahead. Yeah, do we have uh, an estimate or do we have a roster of how many bondholders we have and where they are? Yeah, we could, we do have, we can have that information. We have trustees that do have that. We don't have that at our fingertips. Okay. And just as a, as an estimate, is it, is it in the dozens? Is it in the thousands? Is it in the tens of thousands? Uh, I would say it, it could be to the, to the thousands. Do you have a mm -hmm. guess on that? Don't, mm -hmm. Maria? You get, you're, 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 you're muted, Maria. Thanks, Jim. Um, these bonds are uh, registered under what is called a book entry regime. So that means there is a depository company in New York that is the registered owner of all of these bonds. What happens when the bonds are registered with DTC, that's the depository, is that all of the investment banks whose um, customers have purchased bonds they are the ones that maintain the list. So we don't really have a way of knowing until we um, start <laughs> start some research with the um, the depository trust company and have them try to get us the lists. But I would say um, the city bonds are very popular in the market, and so I, I would say somewhere between dozens and thousands. <laughs> okay. <It's quite laughs> range. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's a helpful range. Yeah. Is uh, two questions? Are these uh, uh, services that our registration uh, service provides to us, or is it going to cost the city money? Um, um, as a general rule, um, it costs the city some money. DTC will provide us. Um, maybe, uh, depending on what the, the investment bankers deal with them is, they may provide us the list of the banks that are holding positions in the bond, um, and then we have to go to each of the investment banks and see if they will share the actual holder data with us. Which they are not obligated to do? Um, if they're not obligated to do it, there are some services out there that are, um, pretty useful in tracking down bonds and the if the bank that is your trustee slash paying agent um, likely has some resources to accomplish that as well. But it's it's not a an easy process. It's not a straightforward process. And the other question is does this affect the city's credit rating, bond rating, how our bonds trade? Is it going to have an adverse effect on the city's finances to do it? Um, so I can't answer the question about finances, but um, I think Jim has a good idea about that. Um, however, if you get consent from the majority of your bondholders, then um, we just have to do a, a notice to the market that says that this has happened and that the um, security has been reduced. And then we will have to tell the bondholders what the impact on their their security is so basically what percentage um, reduction they can expect uh, over time um, it could impact the bond release depending on how much uh, of a hit that is against each tax um, so I, I i also the city has a financial advisor that deals with the, the uh, rating agencies on a regular basis. 
And so I don't know what the threshold is for a downgrade, but it could be uh, cause a downgrade. And I guess I'll jump in here and say that, that, you know, it's not like every dollar that we're getting from the sales taxes, you know, that, and that's backing these bonds is being used to pay the debt. Right. With the 2% bonds uh, off for the, the um, sales and use tax bonds for the buildings, we're getting 58 million or something or more than that, actually. That was just for the general fund. So we're getting, uh, we're getting, Combined, yeah, actually 58 million of that money for a $2 million payment. I don't think that would make a difference. With the open space bonds, we would, we're, we're getting, um, uh, we have $5.9 million of, of open space bonds and, of, I should say, of, of sales tax revenue. And we, the bond <laughs> payment is 2.4 million or so per year. Um, the, the impact of this would be uh, about $793,000. We just got a bond rate <coughs> upgrade on open space bonds about six, seven months ago. My guess is we would lose that upgrade. Now, that doesn't cost the city money. That, that costs those bondholders whose names are, if they're trying <coughs> to go out and, and resell those bonds, they're not quite as valuable as they are right now at the higher rate. That's the impact of that. If we go out and try to sell more open space bonds, which we do have authorization to do, but we only have a limited number of years left of that tax, then that would probably be at a lower rating and theoretically that would be costing our uh, citizens more dollars in interest. So can okay. Jim, based on slide 16 and uh, what you just explained on slide 17. The idea that the city council could just go and hold a vote and change that is, it would be in violation of that, of you know, this understanding here, this general understanding of how we. For, the, for those three funds, so for that portion, the 2.2% of our total 3.53% sales tax. Mm -hmm. We can't do that. But we do have a difference of 1.33% of sales tax that you can go with. That is, is um, oops, oh, that, that is for um, the street fund, yes, and the public safety fund. And that, that does not get restricted because it is not being used to back any bonds. So that could be done uh, for that portion of the sales taxes. Uh, and that impact, uh, the amount of revenue they're getting from food from home consumption is projected here. The ones in yellow, streets fund is almost $3 million a year. The public safety fund is $2.3 million. Mm -hmm. And the next few slides will talk about how much an impact that is for those funds. Is it, is it possible uh, <coughs> if we're going to exempt the food for home consumption, could we replace it with a different tax? A direct tax or a tax on a different item, maybe? Uh, any tax that we would replace it with would be subject to voter approval. Yeah, so it would have to go to a vote. Yeah. Okay. Okay, next slide. So I said the street impact would be about three million. Just to give you a sense, the general the, the street fund for 2024 is almost a $30 million budget. 22.2 million of it is from sales and use tax. And the way we break down the expenses in that fund, 6.1 million is for personal services at salary and benefits. 8.4 million for O and M expense and 15.8 million for capital. And then the public safety fund impact is 2.3 million. And in that fund, it's a total budget this year of 18 and a half million of ongoing revenue. And 17.2 million of that is from sales and use tax dollars. 83.4% um, of the public safety fund budget ongoing revenues are for employee related expenses that really mostly is FTE in those funds and then the difference is really just like their uh, 
OEM their their um, equipment and, and um, vehicles and such. And then finally, the, the city does already exempt purchases of food that is with food stamps and or under the SNAP program. Go on. Uh, when this came up in 2018, the city did initiate a grocery sales tax rebate program. Um, rebates are granted to individuals that qualify for assistance under LEAP or in the, under other, any other city approved means tested program within an equivalent or lower income requirement. Uh, in this past year, we rebated $148,000 to 927 applicants. And this year, the rebate uh, dollar amounts will be for individuals $86.21, couple is $172.43, family of three or more of $225.48. Yeah, um, so that's about 1% of the population of Longmont that is getting this rebate, or no, it's, it's more than that because there's two or three or more people in, in each of these, some of these destinations. So it's several percent of the population of Longmont is already um, getting this exemption. My question is, do we, do we believe that most of the people who are eligible are getting it, or is this, if not, do we know how many more could be eligible? We think that there are more that, that are eligible that could be getting it. I don't know if we have an estimate of how many of them. No, um, part of what we're seeing in this, and this actually started, this actually hit me ahead of the whole conversation regarding food for home consumption. So as part of the housing authority work we were doing, so we worked with voucher holders and other things. And so what we were, what I saw a few months ago, a couple months ago, was that we had somebody coming in on voucher work. And they, was, they had the application for <coughs> the, um, the exemption and the CARES program generally, which is not just uh, reduction in grocery sales tax or rebate, but it's also a utility in that. So we started actually working internally um, in terms of putting together a process, because it takes you back to the definition, any qualifying program. And, and so we started a process that anybody who qualifies that has a housing choice voucher automatically qualifies for this. And anybody that's in um, an affordable housing program automatically qualifies for this. So we're gonna go through and see duplication but then start moving all of those folks into it. Mm -hmm. um, and but for the work and taking on the housing authority, we didn't see that. So we, we saw that. We've also had conversations with, um, had a conversation with El Comente the other day about working and, and this opportunity and working with their client base. And because all of those organizations are doing an income qualifying as part of this. And so that was really something that hit us via that HCV discussion that I had of how we, we can really make this more robust. And so just if you think about housing choice vouchers and people in um, affordable housing that we own, it's about 900 different units and or vouchers that we have that we you know we're probably gonna start moving into the rebate program pretty quickly. And then obviously um, talk to our other housing partners because we know that Boulder County Housing and Boulder Housing Partners have voucher applicants that do live in Longmont as well. So there are really condensed databases that we can get in terms of ensuring that we're getting as many people into the program who income qualify for it. Uh, just piggybacking on that, is there any way we can automatically put families who, through the school district, are on free and reduced lunches? That's changed, and we yeah. did. Mm -hmm. We did do that. Mm -hmm. um, it, it doesn't exist anymore because everybody. Well, no, everybody. No, everybody. Gets everybody in the school gets yeah. free. Yeah. You don't have to fill out. You don't have to fill out the paperwork. So that's, I mean, you know, even before okay. the. Housing choice conversation, Sandy was talking to me about 
what are the other options to use because that program is no longer in existence? They have something though in existence because of kids that need assistance for sports and other activities. I we should check with them. So Jim, you have more? I have one last slide. Go ahead. And that is that, so when we put together this program for the rebates five years ago, we modeled it after Boulders and Nevada's. They had those type of programs, and so we kind of used uh, similar amount, dollar amounts as they did, and we've been uh, increasing it each year by our CPI index. We're proposing to take a look at, I did look at what uh, Boulder is going to have for their upcoming year's programs, and they've gone up quite a bit compared to what we have. So we talked we talk about we would take a look at these programs where we talked about the eligibility requirements and looking at those, but we also can look at the amount of the rebate and try to benchmark those closer to what those other two entities are, are doing. So uh, saying that obviously would be a, a budget impact would be something we would try to look into the twenty five budget. Yeah, and that's the question that I have is is um, where 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 would the money come from? Um, if, if we increase this program and increase, you're talking about reaching more people and increasing the amount of the rebate per person. Right. It would, it would, we've been funding the uh, grocery tax rebate out of the general fund, so we have to come up with that money. And it's ongoing. Okay, we have about five minutes. Uh, real fast, are there any more questions from council? I have one. So uh, on the rebate list of 8621, 172, 43, or 225, 48, when are those rebated to the town? We're doing it all year long, so um, the other entity is actually just doing it during certain months of the year. But we're taking the applications all year long, and we'll do it once a year for any applicant. But um, so they're, it's based on the prior year, so. Like it said up there, we're doing rebates for 23 during 24, and we do it monthly. And we usually will do it as a utility bill credit, but if they don't have a utility bill, we'll uh, also cut them a check. Okay, so my question is, and I, for clarification, when they apply, then you, then they get that check yearly, or did you just say credit? Credit, I meant yearly. Um, they need to apply each year to, to get it, but yes. And they do that. And my concern is, what if the family moves, but they, before that year's up, do they not get that rebate? And we've definitely made partial uh, year credits because we're also, this is the CARES program, and it's not just for the grocery tax rebates, it's also for utilities as well. And so we do them all as a utility bill um, credit, and so as long as they, have a utility bill to credit it to, um, we'll do it against that that bill when it's still outstanding, when it's still in place. So they don't have to come to us if, if they've left to ask for it, but otherwise they're going to get it once a year. What if a renter uh, does not pay the utility bill? And then, like I said, they can yeah. still check. apply and get you know a check rebate. Okay. Is it the standard amount or do they have to keep receipts for their? No, it's the standard amount. It's, 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 it's the dollar amount set or showing up. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Are there any more questions or comments? Yeah. 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 You know, it's like the LEAP program's <coughs> eligibility limits. Yeah. So it really depends on family size and things like that. Can any of those things qualify? So if you have SNAP, we mm -hmm. give any yeah. WIC, any of those kinds of things, mm -hmm. and now and now we're adding Section 8 housing vouchers or LIG property. Any of those programs, any of those programs, you show us that documentation, you're qualified. Um, I can tell you the leave amounts right now if you're interested. There's like eight different family size levels that you have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Think about when we look at the affordable housing, we have the affordable housing limits. Mm -hmm. Similar to that in terms of family size and income and how it changes by number of people in the family. For a couple for LEAP, it's 48,360. Increases by the family size. 
As far as getting consent from the bondholders, is there a difference whether it's a ballot initiative that passes versus uh, the city just saying, um, we will remove the, the grocery tax? Yeah, hey, you know, I'm sorry I missed that, but I, I, I should have tried to be clear on that. So the city council is, is unable to do that because of the bond ordinances. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and, and a citizen initiative cannot Help me out here now, attorneys. <laughs> okay, I'm ready. Yeah. Because I was looking for the email on this one, but it was a verbal conversation. Okay. <laughs> but the yeah. citizen initiative cannot do anything that the council can't do. That's so true. the citizen initiative also would not be able to reduce it in those areas. Oh, okay. It's a good thing that came out. Because yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Right over that. Yeah, that's huge. Okay, um, seeing no other co comments, um, thanks for the discussion. Mm -hmm. So think us. about this. Okay. Uh -huh. We're going to have any questions. Yeah. Pull them together. We're going to come back in a study session to present this. Okay. okay. But I wanted to let you start thinking about it. Thank you. This is a lot of uh, information. <laughs> Thank you. So. Back. Thank you for being here. We're going to end this one. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for being here.